This is Ultra Retrospective, a show where I take a look at various entries from the Ultraman series to see if I think they still hold up. When watching this franchise chronologically, there's a show that really makes a splash. One that comes off as incredibly ambitious, despite the real-life odds stacked against it. That show is 1974's Ultraman Leo. With this being one of the shows Chayo didn't claim illegitimate ownership over, this was one of the first shows I initially watched through officially sanctioned channels. That being Shout Factory streaming service. Quick PSA, I do not recommend viewing it there, or Tubi for that matter. The visual quality is decent and the subtitles are good, but at some point during the remastering process, some moron thought it was a great idea to slap stereo versions of the music over the original mono audio. And all of it, and I mean all of it, is out of sync. The entire show is like this, it's maddening. If you can afford it, pick up the Mill Creek release. It doesn't have this issue. <laughs> With the ending of Taro leaving the Earth vulnerable, an earless Ultra 7 is forced to defend against monsters on his own. Almost immediately, he's incapacitated by the invading alien magma, but is suddenly saved by our new protagonist, Ultraman Leo. With Dan Muraboshi now unable to turn into Ultra 7, it's now up to Leo, known on Earth as the fitness instructor Gen Oturi, to work with Dan to become strong enough to fight off any new kaiju threat. He quickly joins the new defense team Dan is leading, Mac, Monster Attack Crew, coincidentally being the seventh member of the team, which I'm sure Dan doesn't feel weird about at all. <laughs> There is an immediately noticeable shift in tone from the last series. While certain aspects of Taro's cinematography and general filmmaking presentation carry over, Leo is a considerably darker show, starting with a two-parter with impressive practical effects that depict Tokyo being flooded by Alien Magma's monsters, possibly inspired by the recent popularity of Toho's Submersion of Japan, but with monsters, and less depressing socio-political drama. The whipping wind blowing all the water around, the ambitious cinematography, the bizarre yet eye-catching cutting, the dire stakes, the catharsis of Leo's victory, It's all genuinely great stuff. It makes for a hell of a first impression. Early on, the show was willing to blindside the viewer with sudden character deaths. There's this widower with two kids, and we know him for a grand total of three minutes, and then this happens. We even see half of his bloody corpse in the background of a shot, too. This isn't something the show forgets, either. It actually addresses the trauma that would occur from such an incident. These two kids are side characters for the rest of the show, and one of them, Toru, has to grow from the experience. Especially when Gen offers to be his new replacement dad, but clearly doesn't fit the role yet. Even his sister has a moment or two like that, being jealous of other kids with parents. It's surprisingly heavy stuff for an Ultra series to tackle, and I appreciate that it's treading new ground like this. This creates an uneasy atmosphere where you're not sure if the show is going to keep throwing away characters like this. It's entertaining how almost unhinged it is. There is a bit of levity there for the kids, but it really seems like an attempt to win back a slightly older audience after the aggressively kid-friendly Ultraman Taro, and for a time, it works. This greater commitment to an overarching story and tone almost feel like a direct response to other toku that was doing it around the same time, like the numerous Shotaro Ishinomori shows Toei was producing. And it's not just the tone that's dark. Many of the episodes early on have monster fights set against overcast skies or at sunset. And the music from the returning Toru Fuyuki has a lot of trilling, suspenseful tracks that complement this new tone. 
It's probably one of my favorite scores from him, too. It takes a lot of themes from his Ultra 7 score and uses them appropriately, considering Ultra 7 himself is a primary character here. So there's a new formula this show establishes that's used a lot early on. A new alien appears and wipes the floor with Leo. Then he has to undergo a cruel and unusual training regime with Dan to develop a new technique. It's repetitive in its own way, but for me it works. It adds extra catharsis to the monster's defeat. Because we spent a chunk of the episode watching Gen throw himself at a training regiment over and over again, and the format naturally develops to a point where he doesn't need to do this anymore, it really feels like there's a growth in his strength. It is a bit frustrating, borderline comical, just how hard everyone, especially Dan, is on Gen, but he takes that anger and determination and uses it to improve. The Ultra series was no stranger to darker tones, but the commitment to one early on here was honestly really fresh and exciting. That's not to say something being darker and more serious automatically makes it better, but it worked for the show. There were plot threads being set up here. Most of what I've described up until now only applies to the first batch of episodes, sadly. The changes start out small, but there are adjustments to the show's tone and over time its sharper edges are rounded, likely due to parents complaining about a show where an old man gets sliced in half being shown to their kids, which is understandable but disappointing. <laughs> One of the show's primary characters is the returning Dan Muraboshi, now unable to turn into Ultra 7 to help Leo, but still doing his best to train him. He's turned into a real hard-ass since his original show, the lengths Dan goes to force Gen to improve in such a short amount of time gets incredibly entertaining, and borderline abusive. Some of my favorite bits include pelting Gen with boomerangs, making him slice a waterfall in half with his bare hands, and, most infamously, trying to drive him over with a car while screaming bloody murder. Gen! Get up! You get up! Ultramen have had worse injuries than Seven here, so I really don't buy how the show tries to pass off his foot getting twisted as a permanent injury. He's walking with a cane for the rest of his screen time. And the existence of a now much wider Ultraman universe suggests someone could just pick him up and return him to the Land of Light for a quick doctor's visit. But, ugh, whatever. I'll ignore how Taro makes it seem like it's just an episode's flight away. Actually, headcanon time. It's because he wants to experience the trials and tribulations of being a human. Because, you know, he loves the planet Earth and he wants to experience what it's like to be a human. And that includes dealing with the limp leg. But if that was the case, then he wouldn't be trying to get the Ultra Eyes fixed. But So, like, it's probably not the case. But it's interesting to think about. Deep down, he does really care for Gen, though, no matter how comically abusive the training gets. <laughs> Gen Oturi is a fiercely determined, possibly insane protagonist. <laughs> the guy never backs down, even when a training regiment seems impossible. Understandable, considering his situation. His home planet of L-77 was destroyed, so he's doing everything he can to protect his new home. What I especially like is, as far as we know, Gen Oturi is Ultraman Leo's human form. He doesn't possess a dying man or copy someone else's face. Gen Oturi is Ultraman Leo as a human, and I think that adds a little something. Leo as an Ultra is also fairly unique, utilizing a primarily physical moveset compared to other Ultras because he hones those techniques as a human. His fighting style is pretty unique and allows for more dynamic fight scenes. That, combined with Ryu Minatsu's charismatic portrayal, makes Gen one of my favorite Ultramen. It's just satisfying to see him grow over the course of the show and develop his fighting prowess. As someone struggling with getting videos done in a timely manner, I can relate to the process of throwing myself at a project over and over again until it's done. That's what makes Gen's journey so aspirational. Yaka! The other characters of this show 
they're fine. With a couple exceptions, they're on the sidelines, either providing support for Gen or comedy relief. The character who gets fleshed out the most is Toru, but I'll save what he goes through when I talk about the final arc. When directly comparing this show's attack team to the last ones, I have to ask, where the hell did the defense budget go? Despite being led by goddamn Ultra 7, Mac sucks. They rarely get a successful victory against the Monster of the Week or successfully assist Leo, and their roster is full of no-names who exist primarily to either die in the episode they're introduced or berate Gen for doing a bad job. It's kinda saying something about how unmemorable they are, that the only one highlighted in the Mill Creek episode guide is the one who dies in episode 3. <laughs> They're so superfluous that they were ditched entirely in the show's final arc. But I'll talk about that later. Point is, going from Zat to these guys is like trading in a hydrogen bomb for a coughing baby. Like Ultra 7's show, the primary focus of this one is alien invaders. Monsters or humanoid invaders from outer space making their way to Earth to cause destruction. Though, I think they missed with a lot of these designs. Yeah, Ultraman Leo was infamously produced during the oil crisis, a whole thing I don't have time to get into the specifics of, but it impacted a lot of giant superhero shows because of how expensive they were to produce. I think this is partially why the suit quality and designs here suffered. A lot of monsters are just humanoid guys, or obviously repurposed into five other monsters, and the saucer beasts later on are a brilliant spark of creativity. But first, I've got to address the big elephant in the room, and that's the show's middle portion. Hey, uh, kid, might want to keep it down. There are other people here. It's not immediately obvious, and there are certainly some standout episodes and moments, but slowly and surely, Leo begins to change. The changes start small. You definitely don't see any more old men being sliced in half, but the plots get a little dumber, focusing on more light-hearted scenarios that downplay the intensity the show used to have. For example, there's an episode where a Mac officer is attacked by an alien, and both his and the show's concern is whether or not he'll ever be able to ski again. You know, rather than if he lives. There are flashes of the darker tone it used to have, but the shift is obvious by episode 19 onwards. It's nice that the show eventually lightened up to reflect Gen's own growing comfortability with the role of being Ultraman, and it's a little nice that Dan stops being as much of a grumpy jerk. That development at least feels earned. But it doesn't have the same sincerity or drive to tell a story it once had. Even the show's intro theme changes 14 episodes in, replacing it with something weirdly jovial. I really don't like the new one, even though it was apparently the one they intended from the start, According to unsourced fandom trivia, I much prefer the one that was allegedly cobbled together. They don't stop using it for the fight scenes, at least. I reached such a level of cope that I started playing the original opening during the new one just to pretend it was still being used. It seems that during the transition to this new tone, new ideas were introduced and others were forgotten. The first two-parter of the show inferred that Alien Magma would have a much greater role. He did destroy Leo's planet, after all. The second episode ends with an inference that this won't be the last time Leo fights Magma. But Magma only gets one more episode smack dab in the middle of the show, and it's some, frankly, stupid bullshit about him breaking pinwheels so he can mate with a space bird. Outside material says this isn't the same alien magma, but that's never said in the show. And you know how I feel about outside magazine material filling in the holes of a story. And that's it. That's the send-off for the alien who destroyed Leo's home. It can't even be considered closure because the show doesn't treat it like it is. 
The character of Astra had a lot of potential as a character, yet I don't think they did as much with him as they could have. He's the long-lost brother of Leo, who was thought to have been captured and tortured by alien magma when his planet was destroyed. Leo is worried that his brother might be dead. So when Astra is revealed to be alive, you'd think he would have become a new main character, or even a side character. But no. Sure, he shows up in the show on occasion, he's the focus of a two-parter later, but they don't really do much with him. He's kind of just an Ultra who shows up every now and again to help Leo fight a monster. The opportunities for storytelling feel squandered. What if he also had a human form, and now Gen had to train him? Like how Dan trained Gen? It'd be a nice way of contrasting how competent Gen was at the start of the series with how he is now. The inability of the show to give Astra more screen time is especially egregious now that I've seen the full potential of Ultra shows with two Ultramen. They probably fleshed them out in a magazine I didn't read. And I understand that Ultraman is a massive multimedia property that relies on outside material a lot, but Astra has done very little within the mainline entries. I don't think he's a very interesting character. There's this one episode early on, it's probably early enough to be considered an early episode, but anyways, it's about an adventurer who carries around an African shield and does a bunch of dances. <laughs> Whether this is racist or not, it has no business being in the show. It reminded me too much of the worst episodes of Taro, and that's unfortunately what this show becomes at times. Marta! Marta! <laughs> I prefer this show when it's trying to be serious, even when it comes off as goofy. At least then it's being sincere. There are some good episodes during this period though. The Ultraman Jack episode, I guess he's still called Shin Man at this point, features the return of Hideki Go. He's got this mask on him the entire time, preventing him from speaking. I guess at this point they didn't have enough money to pay him by line, but it's still great to see him again. Jiro Dan sadly passed away during the making of this video, so getting to see him in another show so soon was a weird feeling. Rest in peace. But the real highlight of the episode is the appearance of Ultra 7's final capsule monster. Sevenger. Yeah, it's easy to forget he did not debut in Ultraman Z. He has almost exactly one minute of screen time here, but he makes a hell of an impression. He proves to be the most effective capsule monster in Seven's arsenal, nearly wiping the floor with the monster of the week before his time limit expires. Actually, why didn't Ultra Seven use his capsule monsters in this show? It's a weird little discrepancy. In fact, his short amount of screen time is another wasted concept. Ultra 7 had a new capsule monster that could have been helpful, but the showrunners forgot about it and Sevenger never appears again. I am so grateful to Ultraman Z for utilizing him much better and giving him the screen time he deserves. It's great seeing Hideki go again, the team up at the end is a lot of fun, the camera work is pretty ambitious, and Sevenger's single minute of screen time really steals the show. It's a surprisingly solid episode for this era of the show. This series also introduces Ultraman King, said to be one of the most powerful entities in the entire franchise. And here he's introduced in this goofy one-off episode where this happens. And this happens. And this happens. Yeah, kind of a weird episode to introduce him in. Though I did actually enjoy it. It's goofy, yes, but the sinister edge it's got going for it with this balding monkey alien gives it a fun, surreal vibe. It's also a unique little scenario for this show. Leo has to figure out how to return to his normal size. Though I guess it is a little disappointing that the show isn't more clever about it since Ultraman King shows up as a deus ex machina for him. There's also a trite subplot about a kid and his overbearing mother. It's nothing I haven't seen before, but repeated storylines are just something you eventually run into with a franchise that's seven shows in. 
It's worth mentioning that this episode is part of a little mini-series in the show, where each episode is based on a Japanese folk story, which is frankly not a good fit for this show. It would have made much more sense for Taro to do it, which strengthens my theory that this show is using unused Taro scripts. <laughs> It also results in some of Leo's worst episodes. Case in point, episode 27. I honestly don't want to harp on the show's really bad episodes for too long. They don't deserve the lip service, so all I'll say is that they're immensely painful. I originally had more written about episode 27, but there's not much I can say beyond it being cringeworthy. There's another one with a dumb alien that was annoying to sit through. They're both some of my least favorite episodes in the entire franchise. Moving on. There are many instances where it's obvious that the effects budget was on its last legs, but there's no other episode where it's more apparent than in one of the show's final two-parters. This is what the Land of Light looked like in Taro, and this is what it looks like in Leo. This two-parter isn't even bad. The only big thing I take issue with is how mischaracterized the Ultra Brothers here are. Like, yeah, the situation calls for urgency, but they seem a little too vengeful for the Ultraman I've come to know. I don't know, considering how trigger-happy the original Ultraman seemed to be about killing monsters, maybe this line is actually pretty in character. I think it's very funny how the fake Babalu Astra was only able to say because it's probably some fake vocalization he conjured. Maybe he recorded Astra's screams. But when Leo frees the real Astra, the only line he says in the episode is I think it really illustrates just how much of a prop his character is. But yeah, the middle portion of this show suffers heavily from the dreaded identity crisis issue that I think Ultraman Ace has. We do get some great moments with Dan again, I won't deny that. Especially with Dan committing to his preference for Earth, that stuff is kinda moving. But the show was incredibly indecisive about what it wanted to be. At times, it's trying way too hard to win back a younger demographic. It gets just as silly as Taro, but it's worse because it's in a show that absolutely did not start out like this. It was unnecessary, likely didn't even work to regain viewership in the first place, and only results in unintended tonal whiplash when the next episode isn't desperately trying to do the same thing. There's having silly one-off episodes once in a while, and then there's just pissing the bed every other episode. And it seemed like it was destined to be remembered as a lesser Ultraman Taro. But then, out of the blue, it redeems itself. The show's final 12 episodes kinda save it. Perhaps the showrunners saw the writing on the wall and knew they weren't getting renewed. So these final 12 episodes have the same dark tone that the show started with. In fact, it's a little more focused. And, despite the stupid crap happening less than five episodes prior, it actually pays off. This final arc sees the arrival of Commander Black, a man in all-black apparel who summons saucer beasts from the Black Star. And his plan starts with completely annihilating the monster attack crew, a handful of Gen's friends, and even Ultra Seven. It's an incredibly dark and startling beginning to the arc, but it's the injection of adrenaline the show needed. Leo doesn't have Dan to train him or an attack team to help him. He's on his own now, and it's fucking great. I cannot stress enough how much this show needed this course correction. Unlike Alien Magma, they actually commit to Commander Black being an overarching villain here. And he's an actually creepy one at that. <laughs> the saucer beasts sport some memorable designs, finding different and crazy ways to depict a biological flying saucer. 
this arc really has some of Leo's most iconic monsters. This would mark the first extended period of time where an Ultra series didn't have an attack team. The fact that the show can function without one proves just how much the element wasn't working. This was when the show really dove headfirst into the serialization, too. By and large, it's still a Monster of the Week affair, but there's some narrative stringing it all along. It took Gen having to lose almost everything for him to grow, and he really feels more capable from here on out. This was when he fully matured into being a great Ultraman. It's not perfect. Maybe it has too many episodes revolving around kids. But even then, I think that's less of a transparent attempt to relate to the target audience, and more of a storytelling device to make the danger they're put through seem more frightening. Probably a mix of both. Because Toru is now one of the final remaining side characters, it allows for some warmer moments that show his friendship with Gen. <laughs> It's moving at times, Gen is all this kid has. They even introduce a monster that takes full advantage of the trauma and anger Toru feels about the death of his father and sister. The infamous Teru Teru Bozu saucer beast, Nova. It absorbs his frustrations, and I think it's a really cool way to blend the ability of the monster of the week with the character drama. It helps that Nova itself is a uniquely weird little guy. With all these grim moments and slightly grounded character writing, it doesn't forget to be silly, either. No! It strikes a balance of seriousness and absurdity that really works. It's even better than how the first batch of episodes handles it. There, it felt kinda psychotic. Speaking of psychotic, there is one moment here where I think the showrunners might have gone a little too hard. It's in the show's penultimate episode. At this point, Commander Black has had enough. So with the help of a new saucer beast, he succeeds in capturing Leo, then... dismembers him. It caught me off guard the first time because the saucer beast here, Bunyo, is presented as this massive goofball. It ironically makes him more sinister. It works, but I guess the outright dismemberment is maybe too dark, even for this show. Pretty great episode overall, though. If Ultraman King is the reason why Ultraman Leo doesn't have a permanent injury, then, uh, why didn't he cure Ultra Seven's limp? What a dick. The show's finale is also quite good. Maybe Black End is kinda goofy as a final kaiju, but Gen and Toru get nice little bows tied in their character arcs, and the fact that Commander Black's demise is at the hands of children is really goofy but weirdly works as a befitting end. The ratings must have been in hell at this point, but it's still an emotionally fulfilling conclusion. I was teary-eyed by the end. I'm just so, so happy that the show got to end on its own terms, rather than succumb to its dying interest and dwindling budget, and end as a lesser Ultraman Taro. By the end, it was sticking to its guns, which kinda ties into the themes of the show. Like Gen, the show kept failing and failing and failing, but it achieved a satisfying conclusion by continuing to try to make it work. Ultraman Leo is a show I really want to recommend, but I can only recommend the portions of it that I think work. The show starts strong with a series of episodes emphasizing its dire stakes, and the lengths to which our protagonist must overcome his weaknesses. Then it descends into weird, occasionally kiddie stuff. Then it rebounds hard with a slightly more grounded but enjoyable string of episodes that end the show on a great note. I love a lot of the foundational elements, like Gen Oteri's journey as a character, and Dan Muraboshi as the attack team leader, even if some of its execution varies depending on the episode. The attack team is a joke, and all of their scenes kinda feel like wastes of time, the special effects are kinda hit or miss after the first two-parter, and it has a number of wasted elements and downright annoying episodes but the music and fight scenes are consistently great throughout, there are some inspired episode premises, and again, that final arc really hits. It's almost half and half. 
I think 50% of Leo is some of the best Showa-era Ultraman out there. The other 50% is either middling, or some of the worst the Showa era has to offer. The dichotomy is that messed up. That's why, for the first time ever in an Ultra retrospective, I actually made a watch guide. I simply can't recommend every episode. So here are the ones that I think are worth seeing. Leo isn't perfect, but goddammit, they tried. And what works about it really works. As it was, this was the end of the second run of the Ultra series that started with Return of Ultraman. It wouldn't see another major success until... God, until Ultraman Tika. Sure, I'd be doing Ultraman 80 an undue disservice if I didn't address it, but with how many real-life circumstances also holding that poor show back, I wouldn't consider it a major success. A few years after Leo, there was an Ultraman anime that revived enough interest for Ultraman 80 to exist. I might cover it someday, but I refuse to do so until someone makes good subtitles for it. The monsters of Leo would go on to appear later, but, like Taro's kaiju, whoever didn't show up in Mebius is basically doomed to never appear again. Leo would go on to appear multiple times as a supporting character over the years, Gen Oteri himself finally appearing again in a solid episode of Ultraman Mebius. Considering Ultra 7 would appear later in the Showa timeline, it is curious how they never explain how Ultra 7 came back. Maybe they assumed nobody watched Leo, so wouldn't know Dan died in that one. Maybe they explained it in some friggin' magazine, I don't know. Even the borderline abusive training Dan put Gen through has a legacy. It's funny to think how Ultra 7's training influenced Leo to do the same with Zero, and then Zero would do the same with Ginga and Victory. To a much lesser extent. It's a cycle of cruelty, and it's funny. At the time of this writing, there's even an upcoming miniseries named Ultraman Regulos that follows another Ultra that Leo decided to train. By the looks of it, it looks like a new generation Leo. Commander Black and two of his saucer beasts were turned into... anime girls in the Kaiju Girls Black movie. <laughs> That is certainly a thing. He also got a really nice Ultraman Orb episode, but that's not as funny of a footnote. But yeah, Ultraman Leo. The best parts of it make it one of my favorite entries of the Showa era. Top three at least. Check it out. With a guide. Hey, thanks for making it to the end of the video. I refuse to let this one be longer than the Ultraman Taro retrospective, so I'm going to make this end slate short. Here is a readout of my top patrons, who helped make videos like this one possible. Hey, I'm Mooney, Krazak53, Komen, Queer Kaiju, Radiant GV, Chronicler Waba, Alcoholic Alligators, Ryan Santa Cruz, Avok Robot, The Antagonist, Richard C. of Ardon, Ziggy Zigra, It's God Z, Big Odilo, An Actual Demetrodon, CMG, Red Comet Harry, and Marpzilla. Thank you very much.